and teachers, we are back to share with you our insights and thoughts on another challenging question related to the Constitution in American life with us, the friends of uh, Publius. Uh, I am David Richmond, uh, the moderator uh, from Bakersfield, uh, California. We also have Chris Cavanaugh from the great state of North Dakota, former We the People teacher, coach, and uh, outstanding civic educator. Uh, we also have Dr. James Michael Williams from the University of San Diego, Department of Political Science and International Relations, and considered one of the finest scholars to be used in the Center for Civic Ed Professional Development Program. And then we also have a newly published, I think, pseudo author and Professor Tim Moore from the University of Wisconsin Center on the Study of the Constitution. And so guys, I want you to look for this on the uh, New York Times bestseller list here in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, the title is Metaphorically Speaking, the U.S. Constitution Described in Metaphors and Similes, 1787 to 1791. And if you can actually understand that title, you're ready to graduate from high school uh, there. And we are uh, honored and privileged to have with us a special guest tonight and the man most responsible for the Friends of Publius here. Uh, the four of us would not be as close and as untrusting friends as we are uh, without uh, the influence of uh, Professor uh, Robert Lemming here. He is the National Director of uh, the Center for Civic Ed's We the People program. Uh, he's held that job, I believe, since 1995-96. I'm a little fuzzy because I'm getting old. Oh, yeah. for, for a, oh, is it 98? Okay, so for, oh, that's right, that's right. It was after I made the trip to Indiana, you were uh, named uh, that. Uh, so that's going on 24, 25 uh, years. In the organization, we used to have a kind of a little statement. There was uh, kind of like the, you know, a, a, a B, C, A, D notion. There was the B, B and the A, B. There was the before Bob and after Bob. Uh, the We the People program, as good as it was, really took off after uh, Bob Lemming took over as national director, and he developed what was one of, I believe, the finest professional development programs. And that's where uh, the Friends of Publius here, that's where we all kind of uh, connected over the years, and now we've got a lifelong uh, relationship. So we want to thank you, Robert, uh, for uh, uh, creating the conditions that we could come together uh, on, and uh, we, uh, we appreciate you joining us here uh, for uh, this uh, discussion. We uh, do need to take a, a brief moment, however. Tonight's discussion is going to be with a little bit of uh, sadness. Uh, yesterday, it was announced that Charles Quickly, the co-founder of the Center for Civic Ed, uh, uh, co-creator of the We the People program, Project Citizen, one of the national leading national uh, uh, individuals on civic education and law-related education, uh, has passed away. Um, his contributions uh, to this field are numerous and in fact so numerous you know it would take hours and hours to talk about everything that he's done for the field of civic education so there's a little bit of sadness uh, but i know that there will be memorials and and uh, uh, you know recognitions of his lifetime work uh, over the coming uh, month uh, or so so boy do we have a challenging task tonight the intelligence community nsa and the fourth amendment I'm gonna start this out uh, with an individual, not bringing my other uh, fops into this uh, editorial. All right, I wanna provide some transparency. Intelligence gathering obviously implies some element of secrecy. And secrecy, in my humble opinion, is the antithesis to liberal democracy. There has been no greater challenge, in my opinion, to the structural integrity of our system than the creation of the per per uh, per permanent national security state after World War II. The damage to our system through domestic policies like the Talon and CIFA programs or PRISM uh, is wide and deep, but it possibly doesn't even compare to the damage done in the area of foreign policy, which is again, strictly connected to intelligence gathering and the intelligence uh, community. If we look over the years with our covert operations uh, in places like Iran, Guatemala, Chile, Southeast Asia. And of course, we've got the debacle in Iraq, which was based upon intelligence gathering information. I believe we have done some damage to the long-term interest of the United States. That's my opinion. Obviously, the FOPs will, uh, and Professor Lemming here, 
will probably disagree with me and show me how wrong I am, but that would be a normal day in my life. We have a couple of things that we are, you know, we're going to address that I, I want to kind of bring out here. First of all, I think we're going to have to be able to define national security. Is it narrowly defined, broadly defined, uh, and uh, is it so broadly defined that the only people that get to kind of say what it is are those in power? And what problems does that uh, pose uh, to the American citizenry? The other issue is, uh, and, and we're going to talk about this in more depth in, in a minute here, uh, is can we even assess this question because so much information is classified? According to the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, she said that the U.S. government is drowning in its own secrets, that deficiencies in the current classification system undermine our national security as well as critical democratic objectives by impeding the ability of the citizens of this country to have information in a timely manner. I think those are some things to consider as we begin our discussion. So we hope to address as much as we can uh, on what I consider a very, very challenging question uh, for you students who are moving forward to the national finals and a challenging question for any American citizen who happens to be uh, 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 viewing uh, uh, this program. So uh, let's begin with, I think, kind of more of a, a general question as, as you know we do, and that is uh, for the students and teachers who are preparing for this question, I'd like all of you to take as, you know, a brief uh, a moment to identify what you think students should know and be able to do uh, with uh, this question. Uh, Professor Williams? Yeah, you know, I think that, um, well, in teaching Introduction to Political Science at USD, it was always the, the fundamental balance that we start the class with was in a liberal democracy, what's the balance between security um, and, and liberty, right? And for me, the, I mean, the heart of this question is for students to grapple with what is that proper balance? Has that balance been achieved? And I think it's to ask other questions like, um, what gives a democratic state the authority to surveil in the first place? Like, what would be the justification and then to analyze, maybe beginning in the post-World War II period or maybe going further back, analyze whether those justifications still stand up. And then, and then finally, obviously, grappling with the fact that we live in this time where it's not simply phones that are being bugged or letters that are being opened, right? It's, it's all of our data is now um, so accessible um, and it's being held by um, corporations and it's so accessible to the government that it, it it brings in a lot more risks than it had, I would say, 30 years ago. Professor Kavanaugh, anything else you'd add to that? As well, um, well I would just make you? sure for the students to understand. I don't disagree with what Mike said, but there's a line between corporations and, and the government, right? We we agree to get an app, and so we don't read terms of service. So of course, corporations are going to have our data because we just want to play the latest, you know, game on our phone. So we agree to terms of service. So that's a little different than the government. And I think this is, you know, um, and his, there's another uh, question that's coming up, but I think that's the, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes that I always start my class with is very similar to what Mike did. And that's the quote from Madison in his letter to Jefferson about the line, right? That, that, that whole idea of, you know, the, the, we don't know where to draw the line between government order and security, right? Order, security, and, and, and liberty. Um, I think of the last line of Jefferson's safety and happiness. Well, who keeps us safe? The government does. What's our happiness? Exercising our rights. Um, and I would also make sure the students, you have to go back to your unit one information. You have to be looking at Hobbes and the Leviathan. You have to be looking at perhaps a guy named James Otis and the risk of assistance cases, which would take you back to maybe Siemens case of 1604. And the idea that there are places that the government doesn't belong unless they follow due process. And where do we draw that line? And it's a very tough thing. It's a very hard thing, so. Professor Lemming, you probably have a unique perspective on this uh, question. What do you think students should know and be able to do with this question or, or series of questions? 
Yeah, this may be one of the most intriguing questions that we've asked, and and I like that. And and just the as you pointed out, Dave, uh, the lack of information that is available uh, for students to research um, is a challenge. Uh, but there's it's there, uh, and this you know this comes down to exactly what Mike said. It's the struggle to find the balance between security and liberty. And sec security, what does that mean? Uh, in the sense of protecting us from bad guys in the country and protecting us from bad guys outside the country. And it's an age old dilemma that humans have had. This is nothing new, right? Having countries that war against each other, we're not some developed being from anybody since the 1200s, we still act like that. You know, it's like, it's like we live in the Lord of the Flies uh, as teenagers on an island, except it, we, it's the world. The world is a dangerous place. Uh, and is it the ultimate responsibility of government to protect us from that danger? And then what tools can they use to do that? Can they use tanks? Can they use nuclear bombs? Can they use eavesdropping in from uh, techniques to, to listen in to enemies to find out what they're doing? Okay. And does that help protect us? Uh, I don't wanna spend a lot of time right now because I know you have lots of questions, but it's, it's an intriguing question because of the, of the history of what we have done in terms of spying. And I hope we can get into some of that uh, tonight as well. So I'll pass it back. Professor Moore, uh, uh, any other thoughts, uh, you know, from, from, well, a, from a man who lives in the 1790s uh, uh, here? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, well, I know uh, Bob is often fond of using Federalist 51 to lay out that line, uh, Chris's point about where's that line. And in, uh, you know, the, the Fed, Fed 51 is uh, you got to control the government and then you have to control the people. Where's that balance between those two? You got to give government power, but then oblige right. it to control itself. Right, exactly. And, but and uh, I guess I'd like to push back a little on your opening, uh, David. Um, now I, I I kind of agree and 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 maybe not so much. Um, now ultimately, I think to your question directly, what should kids um, pursue in answering this is uh, I, I think they would be well served to look back pre uh, pre Cold War because uh, it, it, it doesn't take much effort to find out that, you know, going back to uh, the, the Stamp Act, the Associators in the 70s, uh, the Committees of Correspondence, the, uh, there, there were all kinds of things that went on in the revolution that had to do with um, uh, security versus liberty. Students, that was 1770s, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but but the... Uh, so, so I think it's, students would be well served to, to not just focus on the uh, Cold War moving forward, uh, to have some history, uh, some history on this. Uh, now, to your point, Dave, is, is uh, I, I, I struggle with the question of, to me, this has always been around, this problem of uh, how much uh, power do government entities or you know, quasi-government entities have. Um, but does the technology that we have now, is it, is it more than just a matter of um, a degree? Or has it changed in kind, the kinds of surveillance that occurs because of the technology? I, I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but a part of me says it's the same thing, but technology may have changed the nature of surveillance, um, which obviously is not an issue for the founders. Well, let me, Chris, can I ask you, and again, this may be just to you, so move on, but I, I, you know, I think one of the key questions uh, that, that we have here is the security of the nation, as you know, Mike first kind of you know, gave us these parameters, is, is the security of the nation and the protection of individual freedom mutually exclusive? Um, no. I mean, is, there, is it a no. binary situation? No, it's not. It's not, but it, it, as we've already laid out, I think it, we know that it's an incredibly difficult task to maintain that balance. 
right? It, it's just very difficult because when you when you begin a nation, like we began our nation, on with certain premises that people have certain rights, and those rights should be protected, and we were willing to actually have a revolution to protect those rights. Those rights are, must be pretty important to us, but we also want to make sure that our stuff is protected. Right. And our, our things, our lives, our livelihood, our nation. Right. We want to make sure. And so, you know, it's back to what uh, Tim and, and Bob said about Fed 51. You got to make sure you can control the people, but you got to control the government as well. And we know that uh, Lord Acton said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And people that believe they're doing the right thing. In terms of national security can go too far. All right, Professor Moore, you are of course, a key member of the Center for the Study of the Constitution and the guy we go to uh, on, on, on the, the writing of the Constitution. So I am curious, is there anything within the constitutional language, the language of the Constitution, I should say, uh, and did the framers deal with this notion of government secrecy at all? Well, uh, constitutional language isn't there, but uh, to your second question, yeah, uh, there were all kinds of um, uh, well, let me let me modify that. If you want to uh, make a constitutional argument textually, uh, you, you've got to do some creative interpretation work. Can I just but, jump in? And I maybe you know doesn't does Article One, Section Five imply? And, and here's and it, it's something I want to get to later. But Article One, Section Five, Clause Three uh, seems to give Congress some sure. power to determine you know, uh, uh, what can, what government kind of <clears throat> can uh, be determined to be secret. Yes, uh, but in, in your in your question, the critical word there is uh, implied. So that, that's why I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to get all textual at that point. Uh, but I mean, you're right, there, there is an, um, an interpretive work to be done. But the founders, uh, I mean, it's interesting, I would urge students to think about three kinds of committees during the revolution. There was the committee um, of association, the committees of correspondence, and the committees of public safety. All of them were floating around in the 17, I say 1770s. Uh, and, and even in, during the Stamp Act in the 1760s, there were organizations that basically were community spies. Um, you know, did you cooperate with the boycotts? That was the association movement in 74. Uh, the committees of correspondence uh, had an element of, uh, you know, local spies keeping keeping track on, on first of all, was there British activity in their community, as well as uh, who may have been, uh, I mean, the, the whole problem of loyalists uh, within the revolution creates a, a fertile ground for a spy network. Uh, New York City, there was, uh, I think it was called the Culpeper Ring. Uh, there was all, and, and a lot of women actually were involved in, in, in spy activity in the Culpeper Ring. Uh, they could kind of move freely uh, through through society without great suspicion. Uh, so, yeah, the founders were very familiar with uh, internal surveillance <laughs> of Americans and whether they, you know, whether they were loyalists or whether they were patriots. So it was a real problem. And Washington used local militias at times for spy networking. Um, so, so it definitely was around at the founding. Jim, were these committees? Um part of the state or were they part of civil society? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, there's, a, there's been some really interesting uh, historiography done on Pennsylvania. They had these committees of, of uh, public safety. Now, I mean, it kind of, this, I mean, it sounds like the reign of terror in France, committees of public safety. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but Pennsylvania's legislature created these um, and they were, you know, they borderlined on vigilantism, frankly, uh, you know, you know riding herd on, on folks, whether they were abiding by, uh, you know, whether they were good patriots or not. So some of them um, were quasi governmental. Some of them were authorized by state uh, legislatures. Many of them were just civil society, which represents a huge problem, I think, in terms of is there any check on a civil society um, civic society kind of organization like that so it's, the, the answer is it's a mixed bag so professor uh well i mean one of the uh one of the aspects of preparing for uh, 
uh, tonight's program is uh, I try to do as much research as I can, and I ended up blowing a gasket, at, at, and the guys can tell you they received a text message from me uh, when I did blow a gasket, trying to get my hands around this question. And one of the biggest frustrations was just coming up with an understanding, a, a definition of the term national security. Uh, in my reading, you know, I must have found 15, 20 definitions, which implied to me that it's so broad and open-ended, and, and that in, a, in the fact of itself is, is dangerous when it's so broad and open-ended. So I am curious as to what is your definition of national security? And we get to take pot shots at you afterwards. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I suggest this go to the National Security Agency website and read their mission statement. Uh, that's how you define national security. Uh, you know, um, it's certainly, I mean, I want to, you know, spy, to me, spying is really the oldest profession in the world. Uh, people have been spying everybody since you can, uh, you know. Uh, you, you keep pushing it back, push it back to Louis the Fourteenth, and spying on all of the nobles uh, who lived in the house with him. Uh, it, it's the the question is not whether or not you have a national security agency. We do, and it's interesting, I think, to historically go back to when it started and what its purpose was, right? Because th this uh, is the idea under Truman that this is a spy agency created by the executive branch that is completely secret, including members of Congress don't know about it, all right? It's set up to spy on the Soviets. This is cold, you know, right up in the beginnings of the Cold War in 52. Uh, uh, and it uses now, because of technology, it now uses listing. We're gonna listen to conversations of our enemies. Uh, you know, the NSA was really happy when the UN was built in New York City because they could sit right off the coast and listen into all the conversations that were going on. Uh, they had the cap 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 capability of doing that. Um, there are some specific historical events I do think kids need to look into. And starting with Francis Gary Powers being shot down in 1960 over the Soviet Union on a spy mission and spending time in prison there and finally being released. Look at the USS Pueblo incident in 1968, where a spy ship uh, was stationed off the coast of North Korea, captured, and uh, those sailors spent uh, 11 months in North Korea under uh, imprisonment. There's some fascinating photos, if you Google them, is photos of these guys being incarcerated and they were, excuse my, you know, they were all hand signaling, uh, flipping the bird because the North Koreans didn't know what that meant, telling you that whatever they're saying is not accurate. Uh, you know, this is a stage, what's going on here and all so forth. Um, the, 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 the capabilities of what, we, what the NSA can do now is incredible. Uh, and that is, is you know, capture everybody's phone calls and everybody's emails. And constitutionally, they say, well, let's look at the Fourth Amendment. It says uh, search and seizure, right? Well, they're seizing everything, but they say we're not searching it because they can't listen to all of this. It's impossible. Even though they have estimated, and this is the secret too, 40,000 employees, all right, uh, 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 co collecting and analyzing this data. Uh, this is an opportunity to look into the Ed Snowden case because he drew out this controversy that Dave is talking about. Has the state gone too far here? L well, look into his, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going on, Dave. Wanted, well, well, again, I, 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 for the students, you say look at the national security website for the definition. One, and, sure. And the and the defi the definition is so broad you can drive look, uh, look, a look. aircraft it, carrier. It says in the Declaration of Independence that the that the purpose of government is to protect its people. All right. There's no question there shouldn't be a national security agency. The question is what can they do? And here's the problem: it was designed to spy on the Soviets. 
In the 60s, it turned on American citizens without search warrants. It turned on spying on people like Muhammad Ali and Dr. Martin Luther King without search warrants. It wasn't designed to do, the Russians don't have any constitutional protection against them spying on it. They spy on us, we spy on them. That's understood. But when you turn the agency on the American people, then there's a constitutional question, it seems to me. And that came to a head in 1977 with the church committee where they, Congress finally found out what the heck these guys are doing. And there's well, some constitutional implications here that well, need to I am, be addressed. Right, and I am, well, I am wondering for, for the sake of the students, all yeah. right, and, 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 you know, I kind of addressed this and, and you've kind of, you know, affirmed this, can the students, you know, uh, adequately address the main question on, you know, has the intelligence community, which by the way, students, I don't even know, you know, how to give you parameters of that. There are 18, all right, uh, uh, umbrella organizations with 1,200 governmental entities, 1,900 private, all right, elements, uh, uh, specific, uh, 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 you know, companies, whatever you want to call them, that are involved in this. And as uh, Mr. Lemming has said, you know, the, the, the hundreds of thousands in all of that that are employed uh, in this world. However, so whatever this intelligence community is, it says, you know, uh, to what extent has it been effective in balancing? All right. Can the students really ever uh, really address that effectively when we do not have even half of the information available? because it's still classified. Yeah, that's the challenging part of the question, isn't it, Dave? It, it's, uh, <laughs> my, my suggestion is for kids and for teachers, started James Bamford. He wrote the trilogy on the NSA, Body of Secrets, uh, The Puzzle Palace, and, uh, and, and The Shadow Factory. There it is right there. Uh, it, he has an interesting history of all of this that I think is, intriguing and I think kids could have fun with. I mean, th th this goes back to, you know, uh, this is not James Bond because it's not, it's not people, it's not sexy like that. It's listening in devices uh, uh, that are, and because of our technology are able to do. Uh, you know, there's even an organization that kids might look into called the Five Eyes, all right? The, who, who was in the Five Eyes? Canada, New Zealand, Australia, United States, Great Britain. Right? They share information, and all of this is extra or, un, or not on anybody's constitution. It's just, they just do. <clears throat> and is that a good thing? Because it makes this play, the world safer? Or is it too much? Th that well, I think... That seems to be a good transition to Professor Williams, since he's our international relations uh, uh, expert uh, here. I am curious, Mike, is, and I think Bob's kind of given you a, a feed in here, is, uh, is secrecy uh, in government uh, uh, pretty consistent amongst uh, 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 at least liberal democracies uh, uh, around uh, the world? Uh, I think the short answer is yes. Um, it, the, you know, just so the students know that, um, at least for myself, we get these questions and we're doing a little research and stuff. And so the research I've done this week on this is that Australia has a reputation of being the most notorious liberal democracy in terms of its secrecy. Um, there are no Bill of Rights in Australia's political system, which means they have laws in the books where they can um, detain citizens secretly for up to two weeks without a reason. They all, all the metadata from phones and computers by law, by law that is kept for two years and the government has access to it for two years. And they can get away with it in Australia because there's no Bill of Rights. Now, those same laws in Europe are gonna be challenged, right? Um, through by the European courts in the United States, we're gonna have those challenges. But as we've kind of been discussing, um, despite that there are ways to argue against it, it's really, really hard to do. And I, I would just encourage the students, because I agree with you, this is a tough question because how do you answer it when there's so much we don't know? But 
there, there's a case I came across from 2013, Clapper v. Amnesty International, and it had to do with FISA, so the, the, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And students, just so you know, any communication you have with anyone who's not American, immediately that is something the government can get to using the FISA courts. And some citizens sued, saying, look, we shouldn't allow FISA just to collect all of my phone calls abroad, because that's what the government's doing. They're just collecting it, right? Whether you've done anything or not, whether they have probable cause or not. That court in 2013 said that the plaintiffs had no standing because they couldn't show that actually the government had collected their individual data, to which Amnesty International lawyers argued, you set this up that we, we can never make a constitutional claim. How are we ever going to know? Because it's secretive. I think that, that that's the kind of information I think students could use in crafting their argument and, and thinking about it. So I would encourage, look at that decision, look at some other decisions for those stories to sort of fill in um, what we do know about what's going on. And, and Mike, I think you make an important distinction here. As you mentioned, uh, Australia doesn't have a written constitution uh, uh, and neither does England, but we do. Yeah. And, and we've got specific you know, amendments that are supposed to protect us. Yeah. Does, does that disturb you? You know, I mean, I can maybe understand, uh, you know, the common law tradition of uh, England and to a certain degree Australia, but we have written prohibitions. Yet this is still going on. And it seems as, you know, as Professor Lemming said, we share this information with other countries. It seems like the only people that don't know what's going on are the citizens who are supposed to be protecting. So do you think that's at all important distinction as the students testify that we do have a written constitution that has prohibitions against? Yes. So I think, yes. But well, first of all, yes, it bothers me. Yes, students need to be able to analyze what the National Security Agency and other intelligence agencies can do vis-a-vis -vis the Fourth Amendment, which I think we're going to get to. But I, I also want to point out that, you know, there's a political culture question here, and there's a Pew research, you know, Pew does all these things. I found one from 2016. And um, over, since 9-11, since except for the year after Snowden released all the data, a majority of Americans have said that they're, they don't think the government is doing enough to protect us, that they should, be, they should be collecting more data. There was one time after 2014 when that changed, when people said the government was doing too much and they had privacy concerns. So that to me is the other threat. Like um, we may not know exactly how much the government has collected. We know enough now to know that they are collecting, <laughs> right? And if, to the, if as a society, we kind of shrug our shoulders and say, it's okay, we're keeping it safe. I have nothing to hide, right? right. Without thinking through the public consequence, how do we resist against the government um, if, we, if we have all this data that's being collected on us, right? So I think there's a bigger question the students could deal with, just with what our values are as a country. If we shrug it off, the government's going to continue to expand what they're doing. Yeah, and I looked at that same Pew Research, and I, I, hopefully you saw the same thing I did, the inherent contradiction there, because 54% in that 2014 disapproved of the U.S. government's collection of phone and internet data as right. part of the anti-terrorism, and 74% said they should not have to give up privacy and freedom for the sake of safety. Yet then they turn around and say, well, you're not doing enough uh, <laughs> there. And then you realize we're a nation of crackheads uh, because we have no idea which way is left or which way is right. So Chris, you get kind of the, the big legal question here. Uh, and, and, and there's kind of layers to it that I wanna go through. Should there, to what extent should there be a difference between, in regards to the Fourth Amendment, between how local and state officials, all right, have to deal with search and seizure and the National Security Agency? Should there be a difference or should they be treated the same? Well, I don't know that the Fourth Amendment somehow applies differently depending on where your location is and what you're responsible for. So I, I struggle with this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a line wait, with wait, you. Wait, 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 just because that, that makes, I mean, I know I'm stupid, but uh, to my understanding, if the police, and again, we all know there's all these wonderful exceptions to, uh, to the Fourth Amendment, but the police have to get a warrant yeah. in order to search, right? 
Yeah. But you don't have to do that under the NSA. Well, that's, that was that was my point, David. That was my, that was my point. I do believe the Fourth Amendment actually should prohibit or protect, depending on your viewpoint, right? And here's I just want to share this line with you. Uh, it appears to me the worst instrument of arbitrary power, the most destructive of English liberty, and the fundamental principles of law that ever was found in an English law book. That was our friend James Otis in 1761, arguing against the writs of assistance in Boston. And I do think this is, and I, I, I started this in my opening statement, I think for kids, or for students, excuse me, and teachers, you know, as, 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 as David and Bob both pointed out, we don't know what we don't know, but you have to figure out where you lie in this, in making your argument. Because this, and the Supreme Court actually cited James Otis and the risks of assistance and said, this is one of the fundamental reasons for the American Revolution. And this is why we have a Fourth Amendment that is so detailed in in this in this you know prohibitions against what the, the, what the government needs to you know its limits on the government what the government must do in, in terms of a valid warrant and that fourth amendment applies to my local sheriff as much as it applies to the national government and so i think students and teachers you need to figure out where that line is and 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 mike i've heard this so often from kids well i've got nothing to hide what do i care and the whole idea is there are certain places that the government doesn't belong. How far, how far will you let the government go in order to keep you safe? Are you willing to surrender all your data, every text message, every search that you've done online, right? And it, it's, a, it's a tough thing. So back to Dave's question, um, I do believe it's a very tricky thing that, you know, to give the government secret powers to try and keep us safe but then still expect them to operate with inside the law. And we know, thanks to Edward Snowden, that the government was not truthful, but certainly under the Bush administration and the Obama administration, they were not truthful in terms of like, because they were searching just inside the country. They weren't relying on that outside connection, right? That Mike alluded to earlier. So, you know, how, how much do you trust your government? And But then people like Dave, you said people are crackheads and the fact that they're willing to surrender everything to be safe. And I think for the students, you guys need to figure out where you fall in this issue and make that argument from that from that direction. Um, well, I'm curious, Chris, what what limits statutory or or, or court established limits are there? All this goes through the FISA courts, right? Yep. So what's the guidance to the FISA courts? Are there standards for the FISA courts to use? Yeah, there is. But, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I uh, was looking it up and I think since uh, the FISA courts have created, they've had um, uh, applications for warrants, uh, close to 34,000 warrants, right? They, you go to the FISA court, you go to the judge or the judges and you apply for a warrant, much like uh, a local sheriff or a local police officer would with a court for a warrant. Um, they've only been turned down uh, like 12 times. Out of those 34, 35,000 applications, they've only been turned down like 12 times for a warrant. And on a couple of those, they reapplied and then the warrant was granted. <laughs> so is there truly a check? I, I, I don't know that there is. Mike? Yeah, I, I just want to know if this resonates. I read this week that, um, like, um, okay, you collect for intelligence purposes um, data, right? But then the courts have said, you can't, it's impermissible to, to use that in a criminal case. And so I've read some things this week that some see that as a check. Like the, the, the intelligence community can collect stuff for intelligence purposes, but if they ever were to charge you with a crime, the courts aren't gonna allow that to come in because it didn't come in with a lawful warrant. The, the fruit of the, for, the forbidden fruit, right? And I, I read some legal scholars say that's a check. And I don't know, I don't see it as much of a check because they're still collecting the data um, and there's other ways that they could they could prove their case but I just wanted to share that with the students and plus they have those 34,000 applications and granted warrants so you know that's where the in 78 when we decided you now have to have a if you're going to spy on Americans you got to have a warrant because there's a fourth amendment all right well this is kind of special so we'll create a new court that's secret. You don't know who's on it. Uh, appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court for a term. Uh, and 
they have these secret meetings with agents who want to set up a wiretap on an American citizen for national security reasons and whatever that case is. And then the court says yes, no, and apparently Chris, and they say yes. So quite a bit. Uh, quite a bit. So do you trust those people or not trust those people? Uh, you know, is, is, do we want to, you know, an agency that was only doing things in other countries, which, okay, maybe you need to do that. The world's not a safe place. Spy on everybody else. But when you start spying on Americans, now the constitution comes into play and the court is that check. How effective that check is, let kids decide that. I can't help but think um, about geography to some degree. Um, you know, I, I, when Bob, you mentioned earlier um, in the session that originally it was uh, to spy on the other, the Soviets. This is the NSA. Yeah. You know, people and, have been and spying so, on each other forever, right? Individuals well, right. spying on each so, other. And the then Americans get upset when the spying goes internal. So I, I, I can't help but think. It seems to be, uh, I mean, since geography is essentially obliterated and it's a small world because of technology, I don't know that Americans, uh, I, I think we're stuck with spying internally because, uh, because there's no, you know, there's no two ocean separation. There's, there's this. It's there's, easier to spy today than it was. Sure, under- absolutely. And geography is obliterated. So who is the other? Who is the enemy? Um, is is much harder to determine in in a uh, a technological based world. So I think the surveil you know well, this you idea look that around. we look, get look upset uh, when we're there's surveillance on American citizens versus right. those, those commie uh, pinko. Right. Well, it's right. a ridiculous distinction because of the technology. The technology is being used on two those two groups of people. Which one do we like? Which one do we don't like? Do we don't you know? And yeah. and is there a difference? spying on the quote bad guys versus spying on you know quote citizens who they yeah. think are bad guys they just happen to live in the united states um so chris i want to come back to you because and this discussion you know another idea because there's a check on you know domestic courts i'll call them you know uh, municipal state court there, there's a check on them Mm-hmm. If, if right, if they issue a warrant in bad faith or without the proper uh, evidence, you know that you know that under the exclusionary rule uh, could theoretically be thrown out. Am I correct, there, Chris? Yes. Yeah. Is there a check on the FISA court? Um, no, there's not. There's not a check on the FISA court. There's not a check on the people that uh, that um, approach the FISA court. Because you have to take it on. The thing is that you, as if I, if I'm a, an agent, right, a CIA, FBI, uh, uh, NSA agent, and I'm applying for this warrant, um, this is kind of a good faith thing. And this is why you have, the, you know, the FISA courts almost never, ever, ever, ever turn down a warrant request. So you have to trust the people in power, right? When they're filling exactly. out this filling out this applic- this application, or you're, they're approaching a judge on the FISA courts for the warrant, and and we know that I mean this is this is in the public domain. We know that those people have not always been truthful. So is there really is not that David? What you're alluding to is that due process check on the our national agencies in terms and the and there are many as you pointed out at the beginning, David. There are many. Um, there's not really a due process check other than perhaps that, well, we're not listening to them. We're just collecting trillions with a T students, trillions with a T bits of data, right? So students, when you're watching this and you think about all those TikTok videos that you watch, when you think about uh, all the Snapchats that you sent that supposedly go away, uh, the government can collect all that. And you're going to yeah. say, well, if I have nothing to hide, I shouldn't worry. But again, or you trust the you always trust the people in power. And, and Chris, you brought it up earlier, and I'm sorry, but you know we sure. we see you as kind of the the you know the the legal. Uh, that's a, that's your first mistake. I you know. Did. Well, th- this whole group might be a mistake from the very genesis, but <laughs> we we are who we are uh, uh, here. You brought up corporations, so would you be an advocate? All right, because of the state action doctrine. And that the Fourth Amendment only protects us from governmental entities, 
uh, there. And it is corporations in so many ways that are gathering this data. And my yeah. understanding is that government can gain access to that data, right? Yeah, there was uh, a, a clause actually within within the Patriot Act um, that just actually the Sunset Law just went down on, but it was required. It actually protected um, private entities, whether it be you know G Google or whoever it may be. Um, you know, think about who does your service, right? AT and T, you know, whatever. It protected private entities, and they were able to work hand in hand with the with the government to give up information, and they would not be they could not be sued, right? So they are protected. So, am I correct to to you know to conclude that this permanent national security state, the, the Intel community, NSA, has pretty much demolish the Fourth Amendment as far uh, as citizens are, are, are concerned? Well, um, when it comes to the intelligence agencies, what, what is our defense? I mean, you know, I mean, to me, Snowden's a hero. But you talk to the intel commu community, they'd like to tar feather and quarter that guy. Yeah, as, as he would be tried for treason if he came than, back. Then worse than Daniel Ellsberg, when in fact, what he did was bring some light all right, to the abuse of power by the intel communities. And so I'm just wondering about the Fourth Amendment. Does it really mean anything when it comes to these agencies? No. Bob, do you agree? Well, the interesting thing about Snowden is, is uh, uh, it, it, you know, there's an exception to, to, to free speech, right? That's called national security. And yeah. uh, like libel, or slander, you can't, those are exceptions to free speech. Divulging national security information is too. Uh, and so, you know, he, he broke the law, um, but he did it with a moral choice of what he knew he thought needed everybody to know. So he's taken the consequences. I mean, he has, I think he lives in the Soviet Union, you know, uh, so, it, it, it's an interesting person to look at. And to, I, you know, to, I don't know. Did you know, the Soviet Union still exist uh, in Snowden's time? Yeah, yeah. Well, now Russia. I got that I'm too. Old, I'm old school. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's, a, what's a commie? Yeah, always a commie. He, he, he divulged to America that people knew and speculated on that it the capacity went from spying on our enemies to spying on some Americans to having the capability of spying on everybody uh, and collecting data. Whether you say that spying or collecting data, these are just word games, right? Uh, uh, but what you do with that information and when you do with it uh, is then a question of what they do in that office behind me. Uh, who do they target and who do they don't? If you uh, talk to the employees of, of the NSA, they, by the way, they live in like a community. They have grocery stores and schools and parks. And uh, sounds awfully like the Soviet Union to me. <laughs> yeah, it's really kind of <laughs> it's kind of weird in its own right. Right, but they're very loyal Americans, as Snowden was too, right? Or you know. They believe what they're doing is to protect the American people from bad guys, whether those are domestic or foreign. So if these are real patriotic, great people and the institutions are, are necessary, I guess my question to you, Bob, is, is, therefore can, is there any limit on what they can do? Because well, if they're all acting in good faith and they're all serving yeah. the American interests and anything they do must be good. Well, I, I'd like argument. I'd like to see the FISA court say no a couple more times. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe you know, <laughs> um, holding them accountable uh, is 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 difficult because uh, you, know, you know the bigger question is is do we just go through life going this is this is natural life we have this going on in our lives it doesn't impact me uh, today I hope that it gets bad guys. Uh, but if it comes knocking at my door, like Chris would say, what do I do? Uh, you know, because of the information that's out there. I mean, I think that your message to students is right on. Uh, 
be careful what you post out there. Yeah, but the thing is, they, the thing is, they shouldn't have to be, right? They should be protected. And I think we're going back to the the people. If you go back to people before Snowden, there were people like a guy uh, last name of Drake. Uh, there was a group called Thin Thread, right? They had a program set up in the NSA that would allow them and to be able to monitor uh, transmissions, to monitor traffic, but do it in a way that was constitutional, right? There were a group of people that were investigated. Uh, because they thought they were the leaks. Uh, and they went after some people and they basically uh, ruined a couple lives because they thought they were leakers and, and they weren't. And these people, they were upset because they saw what was happening and they saw the fact that um, the government was going beyond what they were supposed to go beyond. And so you're right, Bob, in that, that these people were patriotic, as was Snowden. Um, you know, he would see himself as a patriot because when he reads the inspector general's report on the NSA and realizes that, holy, holy cow, this is, this is, you had a mutiny within the Department of Justice. You had a mutiny in the FBI because they were going to actually, they were not going to endorse this because they thought that this was illegal. And you had Addington, uh, David Addington, who was Vice President Cheney's personal attorney, he has the uh, memo in his safe, not even, it, it, it's, it, it's, there's a, so much more to it than this because the Bush administration was wanting this and telling people, if you don't give us this power, Americans could die. And yet there were people within their community we, saying, we, no, no, it's too far, yeah. it's too much. Remember, this is an agency that was started by the executive branch that was supposed to be completely secret, right? is that we're going to do some things and we don't want to tell the American people about it. And it's for their protection. Trust us. Right. Uh, now it's known. And so that now we can have a hearing question about it. I mean, the people don't think about the NSA, but it's got a long history and we live with it and we need to deal with it today and whether or not it's a, there's constitutional questions in here or is it beyond the constitution? Uh, you know, and don't mess with it because the, our mission is so important to protect you that why are you trying to straddle us with constitutional issues? Uh, you know, uh, uh, and we're, we're, you know, it's, it's the same struggle. Keep the, the foreigners out of the walls of the city. We're going to defend that the best of our ability. And now we have this capability of massive information. I mean, I think today I'm going, you know, what's, you know, the NSA is all over what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, they're watching that. And, and, and the problem is for our, ourselves is one third of American history is classified. This is what my spy friends tell me. So trying to deal with presentism of things that are going, especially internationally, is to know what's going, really going on, is not in the national interest to, to, to let out. But it, it, I, I guess I'm, I, I know that the world's largest intelligence agency is watching what's happening in Iraq. Whether they mess it up or not, like you said in Afghanistan, Dave, or not, it's like, how could this happen with this kind of spidency that's so uh, uh, you, you used? How can they mess up? Right? Well, it can happen, Bob, because what happens is people say, well, we have to trust the government because it's in yeah. our best interest. Yeah. And, and that becomes the an issue. And I, I, and I, I said this in my opening <laughs> statement. I want to go back to it. Is um, I, I can't help but think of the Leviathan. And Thomas. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What you know, what do we fear? We fear the not just death, we fear the uh, violent death. We want a benevolent people. dictator, and that dictator needs an agency like this to survive yeah. because the world is a dangerous place. Okay, Professor Williams has uh, been waiting patiently. So no, I, I had one comment, now I have two quick ones. Uh, to Chris's comment about telling students be careful of posting, I just want to say it's not about the posting, it's like with a phone and a credit card, right? The government can track a lot of what you do on a daily on a daily basis. And you may say, who cares? I have nothing to hide. 
But we do know that those who were at the Black Lives Matters protests in, in 2020 were surveilled. We know now that those of January 6th can be surveilled. Like you may not be doing anything, but now the government has access to all this data. They can they know exactly when I go for my runs. They could they could trace that down. And if we think that the government should take actions against me because I'm protesting, they know exactly where I am on a daily basis. And to me, that's a little scary. That's my first yeah. point. My second point to Bob's comment about, and I know Bob, you were you were being provocative about the trust me. I think about our founding and that we are, our constitution is, a, is a, a product of the enlightenment. And our founders spent so much time saying, like the Declaration of Independence, as we've talked about, is this document that says, here are the reasons why, right? We are a system and a culture that has been built on, show me why, justify it. And if we become a society where it's trust me, then we're no better. We should be living under just a king and just be like, you know what? We don't want to know. We want to put our heads in the sound. Make me, keep me safe. Let me buy my, be a good consumer. Uh, that is not the foundation of our system or the values that our system is supposed to have. We are supposed to be inquisitive, curious, and vigilant with our liberty and not just to allow the government to trust, uh, to protect us at any cost. Absolutely. Well, so Tim, and, and, and I don't know if Bob was trying to be provocative or not. He definitely was uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there um, uh, with that. What I find interesting and probably ironic is that in the unit one question two, or is it? Yeah. Unit one question two, you know, same, you know, same class is going to have to deal with this question in a different unit. You know, uh, and, and it seems to me, Bob, you're making a Machiavellian argument, which I've always believed that the United States of America rejects. All right. Not 100 percent, but 99.9 percent. .9%, we reject Machiavellian principles that the ends justifies the means. And I find it interesting that Unit 1 is asked to deal with this question. How, if at all, is the rule of law embedded in our founding documents? All right. But you're telling me that our government purposely went out, created an agency that was intended to be secret from the American people. All right. And I'm trying to square the, the, the circle here of how in the hell does that correspond with rule of law? And what I want to know from you, Professor Moore, is what in the hell does that do to separation of powers and checks and balances? Well, uh Bob from the from the get go has reiterated a couple of times that this there's there's a fundamental problem at the uh, at at the conception. Uh, this was not an immaculate conception. <laughs> this was done by the executive branch and the you know the, the constitutional principle of the uh, the first branch Congress, uh, you know exercising its prerogative in making law and then you know turning over administrative ca capacity to the agencies that, that they do create so it's a fundamental problem from the beginning um that that i think runs afoul of of check and balance separation but also to your point rule of law i mean there's you know and we i think we try to put lipstick on the pig by saying well there's courts fisa courts well really uh, <laughs> those numbers don't bear out the check and balance principle there that there's a court to oversee this agency. Uh, so I think it's a fundamental, I think it's a fundamental flaw in how it's, our system has evolved. Uh, well, uh, do, do you think that it has, that it is the contributing factor of creating this massive imbalance between the executive and legislative branch? I think I think that's that goes back further than the creation of um, uh, NSA. And I mean, there I mean, I'll, I'll toss that to Chris because he's uh, he's very adept at explaining the evolution of the of the, uh, the imperial presidency, as Schlesinger called it. But so uh, but I think it predates uh, the NSA. OK, Chris. Well, I just want to go back and I was I was thinking about this, and uh, you know, in, in preparation for tonight. Um, about the rule of law. And I've said this before, and I've drawn the uh, ire of people, but, you know, we, we try and teach our students that we're founded on this concept of rule of law. And students, I'm going to say something that I'm intending to be provocative, but I'm also somewhat serious. Rule of law doesn't exist in our country. We only follow it when it's convenient. If you think about certain things, 
Have we held anybody accountable for the torture that was done in our names? No. Have we held anybody accountable for the collapse of our economy in 2008? No. Right? Have we held anybody accountable for the expansion of the spy program that was done illegally? No. So and you think about certain times in our nation's history where we've had some clearly violations of law and no one pays the price for it. So the idea is, is rule of law exists. We only follow it. And this is, I'm going to say this, it's what's, it's a uh, 615 central time. Uh, we only follow it when it's convenient. And so what we see here, because it's not convenient to follow rule of law because we're afraid of bad people. And yeah, do we need national security? Absolutely. Are there bad people who want to do us harm? Yes. That's been evidenced repeatedly in our nation's history, but um, has anybody been held accountable yet for trying to, to um, subvert uh, a free and fair election? No. So uh, I'm going to say this. We only follow the rule of law when it's convenient, when it doesn't, when it is perhaps people that, you know, are uh, using a public defender. So, yeah. Well, we're coming down to the uh, end of our, uh, our time here. And so my last question is to uh, kind of to everybody. Uh, there and if you can try and we know how <laughs> difficult that is it's probably the same as trying to keep the NSA accountable uh, here <laughs> is uh, trying to keep our, our answers brief and to the point so we've got the secrecy the surveillance all this intelligence gathering Professor Williams I'm curious and we'll compare it I guess to the 50s and 60s you know those great old days uh, there are we safer today because of these intelligence gathering uh, agencies uh, uh, there? Do you think we're safer today? Um, I don't know. I think it depends on who you ask. <laughs> well, I'm asking you. <laughs> well, what, I, what I'm saying, like, if you ask directors of national intelligence, they would say, of course we are, right? Um, but no, I don't, I don't think we are any safer. And, and here's, here's the reason why I'd say that. I think we... Um, We've created this agency that is now drowning in so much information that it's hampering efforts to keep us safe. You know, in the 1890s, the way we did law enforcement was that we had photos of bad people, and then we'd ask law enforcement people to check the photos and see if they've seen that person. And we started collecting so many photos, it became untenable. So we moved to fingerprints, right? Fingerprints was going to be this great way. And by the 1940s, the FBI is overwhelmed with fingerprints, right? And we're to the extent now that there's a, a facility in Utah that collects all this data, trillions and trillions of data, right? And can they successfully figure out and prevent an attack looking through that? I think the evidence is, is that no. I think that, um, I think it's, I don't think we're any safer. And I just want to also say that it's a fair question, but if I were in the government, I would see it as a trick question because all it takes is one. All it takes is one, one bad guy or one bad person to get through, and you failed, right? Um, right? So I think it's. I think if we live in a world where we think we can be completely safe and that the NSA can keep us completely safe, we're going to be upset. That's not going to happen. And for me, the cost. Even if someone were to argue we are safer, the cost of keeping us safe. To go back to Chris's point. The torture, the drone attacks, the collection of data, the, the literally the government being able to watch people play Xbox Live and then recruit them to, to be spies, which is documented. That to me, the cost is way too much, even if we are a little bit safer, but I don't think we are. Jim? No, uh, and I would add, I mean, Chris's point very at the very beginning is uh, that there's a whole new uh, big brother on the scene and it's uh, corporate. Uh, I don't think we're any safer uh, uh, at all because the, the data collection of, of private companies uh, adds to the problem. Uh, there's, a great, there's a great one hour, thing, uh, Frontline did a thing called the social dilemma. I would urge students to really watch that piece. It's fantastic and it has to do with corporate gathering of data and how algorithms uh, really work. It's a fantastic piece. So I would say we're not less, uh, we're less safe 
because uh, of government issues, but also of corporate issues. Chris? Um, oh, you know, Mike's point is well made. All it takes is one, right? And you can go back and take a look at whether it be President Bush or President Obama or other presidents and saying, we need this power to keep us safe. And if you don't grant us this power, then blood is on your hands, right? So, and we know that no matter who the person is in the Oval Office, once that power is there, they're not going to give it back. It's not an R or a D thing. They're going to hold on to that power. Are we more safe? I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know that. I, and we're back to, the, I think, back to what you guys talked about with the Pew Research Center. I think most Americans, you know, they don't care. They're, they're, they're fine as long as they can play the latest game and whatnot. And uh, Tim, I think that the, the documentary you're talking about is on Netflix, The Social Dilemma. And it's also, there's another one called, it's called The Great Hack or The I think it yeah. might be called the great hack. And, yeah. and we talked about this before about data, you know, and that that is the next realm of rights. Who owns my data? Right. That kind of thing. So are we more safe? I don't know, David. Honestly, I don't know. And, the, the, you know, I think right now I hate to say this. I don't think it really matters to most people. Professor Lemmy, you get to wrap okay. us up. Well, the answer to that question is classified. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. you have to have a certain level of clearance to know whether or not we're actually safe. And there are people who know that, but there's only three or four of them, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, closing statement there, then, Mr. Lemmy. Yeah, well, uh, that, that was a that was, that was a really good answer, by the way. Yeah. Because, uh, it, any closing statement you'd like to make to the kids and teachers? Yeah, Dave, I want to thank you and the rest of the crew uh, for inviting me on your show tonight. It's It was a blast. It goes by pretty quick. Uh, it's always intriguing questions. I'm happy I could participate in whatever uh, uh, information I could give out. Uh, uh, it's, it's banter back and forth uh, that uh, disagreements, agreements, and it's civil. I mean, it's a great example of what people should be doing uh, all across America with these. And so uh, it's a privilege to be here tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, and we, we really appreciate that you joined us. And I hope you know from the bottom of the hearts of, of all of us, uh, you know, I, I go back and I'll go back to 1997 when I first met you. Uh, you know, uh, uh, my whole life uh, after that point was defined. Uh, by meeting you and you uh, opened doors and gave me opportunities that I could never imagine uh, when uh, I was a freshman at college or whatever. And so uh, your legacy is, uh, is imprinted uh, in the minds and hearts of thousands of people. And uh, so we really appreciate all that you have given uh, to teachers uh, and to students uh, across the country. And uh, we hope uh, if we're able to continue into the future uh, if one of us isn't, uh, you know, removed from society by the NSA, uh, then uh, we will uh, we will love to have you back uh, on another topic there, Bob. Absolutely. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, students and teachers, uh, I don't know what our next topic will be, but it'll hopefully be uh, as interesting, as scintillating as this topic uh, has been. Until next time, peace, love, yogurt, tacos. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.